Welcome everybody to our Ignite Startup Workshop on Startup Funding Basics. My name is Amanda Golden and I'm the Program Manager in the Herb Kelleher Center for Entrepreneurship. And I'm excited that there are so many of you here today to learn more about funding startups. We're excited to have with us today, Brian Hall. Brian is a member of Traverse Legal PLC and the managing partner of its Austin, Texas office, doing business as Hall Law. He is the founder of Traverse GC, a monthly fixed fee subscription-based provider of general counsel services to companies. He has represented enterprise internet and technology companies, startups and brand owners throughout the world with their intellectual property and internet law needs, including such areas as digital and social media, advertising and promotions, privacy and data matters and business law issues. Brian has served as outside general counsel as well as in-house counsel in a second mint role to private venture-backed companies, public companies, and venture capital funds. Since 2015, he has been general counsel to Notley Ventures, the social impact company in Austin, Texas. Brian has also litigated cases across the United States involving trademark, domain name, copy, copyright, software trade secret, online defamation, and privacy and personal rights issues. Please help me welcome Brian. And at one point, um, at, towards the end of this presentation, Brian will be taking questions from the audience. So be sure to use the Q&A feature uh, in your Zoom menu to submit those questions. Brian, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Amanda. Good, good to be here. Let me uh, share my screen and um, hopefully everybody will be able to see what, what we're looking at. How does that look? Can I get a can I get a confirmation that, that you can see that, Amanda? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Well, appreciate the intro. Um, you know, I, I envisioned when I signed up for this uh, probably a year ago or so that we were all going to be together on campus. Obviously, that's not happening. So uh, we'll make do from our individual um, locations. I currently am in my element. I'm at my stand up desk um, at my home office and uh, excited to spend the next, you know, about 45 minutes with, with everyone on this. Um, so let's jump in. Let's talk about some of the startup funding basics. I won't go into more detail than Amanda did. Um, obviously, you're not here to learn about me. You're here to learn about uh, startup funding basics for your, your company or your venture. So um, if you want to know more about me, here it is. I know that this uh, presentation will be made available after this. You can reference it and you can always find me online. Uh, I do want to introduce uh, my colleague, Stephen Ahrens. Um, Stephen and I work together here in the Austin office. Um, we'll typically work together in the Austin office. He leads up our corporate and securities practice. Um, background all within the startup venture and fund space. And I'd say most unique to him is uh, he truly is one of the, I think, uh, small number at this point of Austin natives. So Stephen will be uh, chiming in throughout this and, and working with me to you know, hopefully give you, you all the information you're looking to get out of today. So why are we here? Um, you know, obviously we're all at home or somewhere else and, and not in person. So we're here because we're trying to get further education about something that means something, right? So my goal is to give you some insight into how startup lawyers like, like us practice, um, give you some insight into some of the things that you should be thinking about um, in whatever role you're in, right? Whether you're a fellow startup attorney or just a practitioner, whether you're somebody in the community that plays in this area, uh, meaning the venture area, um, whether you're trying to start up your own venture, whatever it is, we hope to give you something today that you can take away and have a better understanding of what we do and what we're talking about. As part of that, we want to be talking some of the same language. Um, you know, lawyers tend to use legalese more than, more than um, maybe is helpful to the general public. We'll try and steer clear of that today, but we definitely will um, educate you about some of the terms that you'll be needing to be familiar with as you go through whatever your, your efforts are in furtherance of your particular goal. We wanna talk about some of the funding options. Um, you know, there's definitely more than one 
And you may be familiar with some, others not so much, but we will go through those today. Um, and ultimately, I hate to give legal disclaimers or, or you know, be like every other lawyer, but we can't give you particular legal advice about your situation. That being said, we're gonna share what we can, share some experiences and uh, just be mindful of that throughout. Why are you here? I'm hoping and thinking you're here because you wanna learn something. Um, I'm hoping it's more than you're, you're sitting at home with nothing else to do. But uh, at the end of the day, my guess is there's a fair amount of you who may not be bankroll, right? May not have a pile of cash that you're sitting on to simply go do whatever you wanna do, um, success or failure. And instead need to be strategic, you need to think about how you can acquire the necessary funding to put your idea um, or your dream into play. So um, my belief is that's why a lot of you are here and hopefully you get out of this what um, you know, we're putting into it. Um, so with that, we will go to the next slide. So in furtherance of what I mentioned on the last slide about uh, making sure we're speaking the same language, uh, it's interesting. If you ask three different attorneys and maybe even three different um, you know, founders what a startup is, you may get three different answers. And the reason for that is startups have evolved over time. And here in Austin in particular, um, the definition of a startup has evolved over time. When I moved here seven years ago, a startup uh, and how it was defined is probably different than what it is today. Uh, I think we're getting closer to Silicon Valley than what we were as Silicon Hills seven years ago. But let me try and put some parameters around what I think Stephen and I view as uh, early stage growth stage and enterprise stage startups and what I think is the, uh, you know, probably pervasive thought around those within at least Austin. So when we talk about an early stage startup, we're really talking about um, a founder with an idea or a dream, or maybe, uh, you know, a founder and a co-founder and potentially, you know, a team, a small team around them. They have a business idea, they're probably not post revenue. Um, they may be delving into some revenue, but they don't have enough that they can implement everything needed to hopefully achieve that dream and put that idea into play. Um, and when I talk about the idea, you'll hear me reference things like IP, intellectual property, probably for another topic, but one in the same, right? That idea, that secret sauce, what, what you may think can make this business successful is something that you want to be protective of. Um, and you want to differentiate, differentiate yourself from others with, um, but you may not know how. Uh, ultimately, you also want to be thinking about mitigating risk against personal liability. And this is one that we see all the time. A founder comes in and says, I have an idea. I also have a house. I have a family. I have a car. I don't want my idea if it goes poorly to jeopardize those things. So an early stage startup is starting to think about how they can set up an entity form something that can be structured in a way that gives them that peace of mind. Uh, you know, an early stage also is typically wanting to do it right the first time in hopes of saving time and money later, but hopes aren't always realities. And, and what we see all too often, and it's not right or wrong, it's just reality, is uh, a founder may not be at a stage where they have the necessary funding to do everything by the book, right? They may not be able to follow your best practices list and instead have to be selective. And part of what we try and always do is, is help them be selective by prioritizing the things that need to be attended to at each stage. So early stage, as its name indicates, is really early. Growth stage is the next stage. And that's really where you've sort of crossed the chasm from idea or dream to the wheels are turning, right? You have some customers. You have, uh, if it's a product, a, a minimal viable product. You have something that you can show, something tangible, something more than just um, more often than not what we see. And, and like I said, is okay, depending upon the stage, just a slideshow of what could come. You're now already into it. And you know, at the growth stage, you're starting to deal with more sophisticated levels of um, you know, third parties, right? Whether it's customers, vendors, investors, Whatever it is, these people have typically been there and done that as well. They may even have outside advisors, be it financial, legal, wealth, et cetera. 
And, uh, you know, growth stage typically requires, um, you know, as the name indicates, a set of growth from an early stage to this level in order to continue the, the hopefully hockey stick rise. Um, and, you know, you're trying to make money at this stage, not that you weren't at the early stage, but really you're trying to scale, um, trying to take it from that idea, take it from that first customer to something bigger. The, I won't call it the final stage, but the, the final stage on this slide, enterprise stage, we'll save that for another day. Maybe some of you here today are in that world and you're looking to get out of it and go back into the early stage world. You know, a repeat founder is something we deal with on a daily basis, but we'll talk about enterprise stage when, when you all get there at a later time and, and some of the different things to be thinking about. So focusing on, again, more of the early stage and growth stage startups, you know, what I wanted to do at the outset is talk about some of the top legal mistakes that, that we see when prospective or even you know, existing clients who are doing it again, um, come into our office or, or call us and, and tell us what's going on. The first, too much DIY. Do it yourself can be an amazing thing. And uh, you know, I'm a big believer that doing it at least once yourself gives you the ability to delegate it better, the ability to understand you know, what goes into it. Um, but there's times where that's not the best way to do it. And legal, in my opinion, is one of those. And I'm not saying that because I have a vested interest as an attorney. I'm saying that because I've seen the result too many times. And do it yourself legal, depending upon what you're doing, can just be detrimental in some ways, but also can just increase the time and cost to correction and ultimately getting to that growth stage and hopefully that enterprise stage. The other one, being an emergency entrepreneur. Uh, again, entrepreneurs, the passion, the, the drive, the desire to actually go from an idea and create something and deliver it and improve the world as a result of doing so, also um, typically can create issues if that entrepreneur isn't thinking about some of the things that they need to be thinking about. So be it legal, financial, um, insurance, these other things that maybe an idea person may not typically have as front and center. They have blinders on, ready to go and deliver, but need to be mindful of those things. And all too often, the only time that they think about them is when an emergency pops up. And one of the things that, you know, I want to share with everybody today is it doesn't have to be that way. There are certain things that any business should be following in order to put themselves in a position to avoid emergencies. That being said, emergencies will happen. They're inevitable. And the more you grow, the more you're doing, the more they're likely to come up. But if you've prepared the house, right, your legal house is in order, then you're in a far better place. And, and what I can say is we'll talk about some of those today. There's resources that I have at the end of this slideshow where there's checklists and other things that you could go to, but be mindful of that. The third one, mixing business with other business or personal. But, but, but we are best friends. What I mean by, there, by that is so many times somebody has come in and said, hey, I'm so-and-so, this is my co-founder, we're best friends, or maybe we're in a relationship. You don't have to worry about us breaking up. Let's focus on something else. More often than not, Unfortunately, it doesn't turn out to be that way. So hope for the best, plan for the worst. That's my mantra to early stage companies. Hope for the best, plan for the worst. Next one, if they build it, they will own it unless you ensure otherwise. This is really to the idea, or as I mentioned before, the IP issue. What people forget is that under most intellectual property laws, whoever creates something is the owner of it unless they're in an employment relationship or there's a written agreement saying otherwise. So, you know, as you build something as an entrepreneur, typically you're relying upon help. You can't do it all. And unfortunately, too many times we see where somebody might ask a friend to do something or ask a third party service provider to do something without getting that agreement in place in writing to make sure that the entrepreneur is the owner of it. And it really comes back to bite them when their idea takes off. And when money starts flowing and that other person or entity sees an opportunity, unfortunately. And then the last one, the family lawyer. Um, I think this applies to not just entrepreneurs. This applies to everybody. It applies to my family. I get calls from my family all the time asking me about 
legal issues that aren't my areas of practice. Uh, I equate it to, you know, a brain surgeon getting called about somebody having a, you know, ACL injury, right? It, it doesn't work that way. And specialties are there for a reason. And, you know, the last thing I want an entrepreneur to do is rely upon bad counsel. Again, be it legal, financial, general, whatever it might be. Don't rely upon the family lawyer, rely upon um, people who have been there and done that. So when we're talking about the startup world, the venture world, um, that whole space, it's important to know who the players are. And again, this goes to the nomenclature we talked about at the outset, making sure we're speaking the same language. So you've heard me use some terms already like founder, entrepreneur. Those are typically the person that's looking to start up whatever it might be, right? The idea person, the person with that dream. And it might be a person, it might be an individual, it might be a company. That person may have already formed an entity. They may already have a co-founder or other people that are part of it, but that is all together at some and substance, one in the same, you or your company. And, and that's how we'll refer to it throughout. The others, the other half of, of startup funding is, or, or are the investors, right? And Austin is a great place to be because there's so many investors now. Um, you know, again, when I first got here, there were, and uh, I think more people are moving here and there's, there's maybe more money and more opportunity as a result. So you start to hear about the types of investors and those vary, but the, the main ones that I want to make sure we're all speaking the same language about are, you'll hear friends and family, right? And you hear that a lot when companies are at a raise of, a, you know, maybe initial money in the door. It's, hey, let's go to my network of friends and let's go to my network of family and see if, you know, dad or uncle Jim or, you know, my aunt Connie will give us some money to get this venture off the ground. As we move past friends and family, we get to angels and angels can really come at any point in time. A lot of times people think angels are early stage capital, right? Money needs to be, uh, you know, raised in order to get this idea off the ground. But angels can come in at any stage. But if we focus on early stage, yes, it will be early stage angels. And angels could be high net worth individuals who have had successful outcomes and are looking to deploy capital in a way that they diversify their investment portfolio. They may be part of, of groups. So Austin in particular has Central Texas Angel Network. Most major cities, and at this point, most of the other cities, um, have them as well. And they're a good way for entrepreneurs and founders to get in front of people, pitch their ideas and potentially secure capital. Once we get past angels, we get into more what we call institutional um, investment. And Stephen will be talking uh, a little bit more about those today. But what I mean by institutional is venture capitalists and private equity, incubators or accelerators, um, sometimes used inter interchangeably, really shouldn't be, but, you know, just to give some examples, you know, here in Austin, there's, there's CPG um, accelerator known as uh, SKU. That's but one example. There's plenty of others. A lot of you have probably heard of, of some of them that are here in, here in Austin as well. Oftentimes now they're, they're specific to a vertical, whether it's CPG, whether it's tech, whether it's software, whether it's something else. And then the other is corporate venture. So a lot of, uh, you know, bigger companies now uh, have started a part of their, their company that they want to invest in early stage startups. And typically they do it for a couple of reasons. One could be altruism, right? They want to give back and help the community. The other is there's no better way for them to learn what's the next up and coming idea, what's something else that might help their business. So you'll start to see some of those if you have not already. So Knowing a little bit more about the language and the players, let's talk about what I referenced earlier as that legal checklist, because we'll get into some of the detail around each, but I think it's important to, to be mindful of the things that you, as a founder, as an entrepreneur, should make sure you're thinking about and hopefully checking the box as you move forward. The first, entity formation, right? I talked earlier about you don't want to have personal liability, so it's important to 
think about what are my options to mitigate against the risk of somebody, if something goes wrong, coming after my house, my car, the things I mentioned before. And there's a whole slew of options, corporations, LLCs, partnerships. We'll talk about that in a little bit in a little role play section. The other is um, there's a bunch of considerations that you need to be thinking about when you're picking that type of entity. Uh, are you looking to finance through friends and family or are you eventually gonna try and get into one of these incubators or, or accelerators? The answer to that question can rightfully dictate what attorneys might recommend to a entrepreneur or founder. Do you have co-founders? Do you have other people that are key employees that you wanna set up certain equity or incentive compensation plans? Those kinds of considerations. And, and look, I don't wanna lose sight of the fact that at an early stage, some of this can seem overwhelming, right? Especially when I mention things like involve your CPA or tax advisor, that sounds great, right? But we all know that that may not be a realistic thing depending upon what stage you are. So again, view this as, Here's what an ideal world would be and a best practice from a legal checklist standpoint. The likelihood you can check everyone, you know, to each their own. The next one when we're talking about entity formation is we also have to be contemplating, regardless of the entity, how are we going to structure this entity? How are we going to put it together in a way that gives the owner, the founder, the entrepreneur, the most ownership, right? They're putting in all the sweat, all the hard work, had the idea. Shouldn't they have the most ownership? Those are questions that need to be thought about and answered. Control. Ownership's important, but so is control. If you bring in a bunch of people, they don't have a lot of ownership, but your agreement states that they can have as much, if not more control than you, is that problematic? Potentially. So again, those kinds of considerations you're getting more into the legal realm, but definitely something that is a risk tolerance question for the entrepreneur. Where to form the entity? It may sound like, hey, we're here in Texas. Shouldn't it be in Texas? May not always be the case. Depends on the type of entity, depends on what you're trying to accomplish. The reason I put Delaware that you'll hear from a lot of corporate attorneys is Delaware is sort of the most favorable place for entity formation for various reasons. Um, you know, most established corporate law is one of them, uh, which gives more certainty as opposed to uncertainty in advising. But there are drawbacks, right? There's different costs associated with filing, et cetera. I mentioned the LLC, or I mentioned that depending upon where you're looking to raise money, there may be different considerations. One that I just want to highlight here is the LLC may be disfavored by institutional investors. And that's that's one that I really want to highlight because there's a pendulum that I've seen in Austin. And when I first got here, there was a movement towards LLCs are fine. You can form your entity, be an LLC. That's starting to swing back to what it was before LLCs became the thing to corporations. And the reason for it is there's different limitations and, and uh, items surrounding each of these types of entities that may not be favorable to an institutional investor, for example, be it tax or otherwise. So Definitely something to be thinking about early. Uh, finally, NDAs and IP ownership. I mentioned it before, uh, you know, unless it's in writing, you may not own it. So always wanna be mindful of that. Next, legal checklist continued. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Steven jump in and, and go through the, the financing and some practical considerations around that. Thanks, Brian. Nice to uh, meet everybody out there virtually. Um, so as Brian said, it's important to put yourself in the right legal structure um, and, and whether that's an LLC, a corporation, what state you're organized in uh, versus what state you're operating in. And some of those decisions uh, depend on the type of financing instrument that you're going to raise your capital through. So uh, as Brian noted in the beginning, most of you, uh, if you've started a business or are thinking about starting a business, are unlikely to be bankrolled. How do you get bankrolled? Well, there's a couple different ways to, uh, to raise capital as an early stage company. And you've probably heard of a series A financing or series A, B, C, D, and so on. And, and what that means is that selling preferred stock as we have here. But that happens typically much later, later down the line. More often than not, an uh, early stage company is going to raise capital through a convertible instrument. Uh, a promise to grant equity at a later date for a certain amount of money right now. And that amount 
um, of stock that, that somebody's getting at a later date is determined based on a triggering event down the line. So what are those instruments? Well, it's a convertible note, which, is, uh, which we're gonna talk about in more detail um, in, in our little role play example as we move forward, or a simple agreement for future equity, which is the fourth uh, line there. Uh, both those work very similarly, as we'll talk about later on, and are great ways to get early stage companies to raise capital without having to determine how much is your company with worth right now, excuse me. And then later, after you've raised your initial financing through a convertible security, you'll end up selling preferred stock in a series C, series A, B, C, and so on round. And as we have here, some of the practical considerations to determine what instrument you're gonna use, uh, how much capital are you trying to raise, uh, how quickly do you need that capital because some of those instruments can close more quickly than others. Uh, there's also different disclosure and regulatory uh, concerns with respect to each type of instrument, uh, which plays into the speed and, and how quickly you can get the money. Also, who are your potential investors gonna be? Brian showed you earlier who the players are depending on what type of player they are, they may be interested in a different type of security that you're gonna be selling. Um, and so those are some of the considerations to help you determine what type of financing instrument you're gonna use. Great. So let's jump into you know, this role play that I've mentioned and Steven mentioned, because I think this is a great way to um, give you a real world example and see not only how we uh, you know, as attorneys can work, but also you as a founder and, and someone else that's looking to accomplish startup funding could work. So in this example, let me set the stage. So Eric and his business partner, Michelle, are starting a software company and they've developed an e-commerce online ordering solution. Eric's the business or idea guy. Michelle is the engineer or software coder. So in this example, I'm going to be Eric and Steven is going to be Steven as the attorney. And what we're going to do is come in and tell what we want to accomplish, which is get an agreement in place that allows our new startup venture to be owned 60% by me and 40% by my trusty coder, Michelle. Steven. Nice to meet you. I'm glad you're taking some time to help us out today. Um, I need an entity set up. I have this brilliant idea for my e-commerce solution. Michelle is the engine behind it and we need to get an entity set up. I've heard about LLCs, corporations, but I don't know where to go from here. So can you give me some advice? Happy to Eric and, and thanks for uh, making time today to meet with me. So you mentioned a couple of different entity options, one being a corporation. Let's talk about corporations first. Corporations have a lot of benefits for early stage companies. Of course, they also come with some, some drawbacks and it's important to evaluate both the pros and cons before we decide which entity to put you in. Um, some of the benefits of a corporation are, are that they're, uh, they're fairly easy to spin up and, and their standard documentation that both founders and investors and employees are familiar with. So as your company grows and as you go out and raise capital, you're going to be in a structure that a lot of investors, certainly later stage institutional investors are familiar with. Um, it also, because it's streamlined, typically we can do it for a flat fee or a fixed fee without, uh, so that all our phone calls and all the back and forth between us, you don't have to worry about any of that. We're going to set a a defined price, that's what you're gonna pay and we're gonna take you from start to finish uh, with respect to your corporation. Of course, like an LLC as well, it provides liability protection so that, um, so that the entity itself uh, protects its, its stockholders, the people that own the business, as well as, as, well as, as, well as its directors, the individuals who are making uh, decisions on behalf of the stockholders for the business and the officers who are appointed by the directors who are running the day to day. Now, often with an early stage company, those are all gonna be one and the same. It's probably gonna be you and Michelle as uh, officers of the company. It sounds like you're both gonna be stockholders in the company and, and maybe you're both gonna be directors along with other people. 
Some of the drawbacks of a corporation, however, are that, uh, that there could be a scenario where double taxation occurs. That means the corporation is, being, is paying the corporate tax rate and it's being taxed on, its, uh, on the activity that it has, the profit and loss activity, as well as uh, potential tax for the individual stockholders that are receiving um, distributions or, or dividends uh, from, from ownership of stock. And unlike an LLC, you have to follow a few more traditional corporate formalities that are stipulated by statute. You have less flexibility to decide how you're gonna run your business. You have to operate within specific parameters that apply to corporations. Got it, and I took a business law course in, in college. So when you say statute, you mean just law, right? That's right, okay. that's correct. And, and I don't like the idea of corporate formalities. I, I'm an idea guy. The concept of keeping a corporate record book sounds scary. So can, can you tell me a little bit about limited liability companies or LLCs? Sure. So the, the second most common structure that uh, most of my clients utilize is what's known as a limited liability company. Uh, and really what a limited liability company is, is the baby of a corporation and a partnership. Uh, it's, it's a hybrid of the two and it can look like, it can look right down the middle or it could look more like a corporation or more like a limited partnership. And when I say look like, that's because there's a lot of flexibility in how you structure a limited liability company. Um, the limited liability company is governed by law, by, by state laws and federal laws, statutes, as we discussed, but uh, most of those statutes are subject to a written agreement between the members of the limited liability company. So you have a lot more flexibility to create a relationship uh, within an LLC that is what you envision it to be, whatever your ideas are. Um, some of the other benefits that, that early stage founders like are the pass-through taxation, meaning that all the activity that happens within the LLC flows di directly to the owners of the LLC, as opposed to the entity itself paying any tax. Certainly, if there are losses in the early years of running this business, that would flow through directly to your tax return and could be beneficial to you and possibly to some of your early uh, investors. We talked about flexibility. Uh, while you can choose to obligate yourself to follow the same corporate formalities that exist in a corporation, you don't have to at the same level. And just like a corporation, there is a liability sh shield, hence the name limited liability company where both the owners and the managers of the business are protected from further liability. However, with all those benefits comes an added cost because of the customization and flexibility of a limited liability company and the need to draft an operating agreement to govern that company, it typically costs a little bit more money. And later on, you're likely gonna to have to convert to a corporation if you expect your company is gonna be a target for venture capital investors or other institu institutional investors who are often prohibited from investing in a pass-through entity. Got it. And, and look, if, if I don't have either the, the, the types of dollars that you're putting in here as sort of market rates, um, you know, I know there's self-help tools out there. There's legal zooms and, and, and these other entities that, that can spin up, you know, some structure for me. Is, is that something okay to use? And then I can come in later and we can talk more about what happens next. I'll give you the standard lawyer answer, which is it depends. Now, uh, I'd say if you're going to use one of those docs in a box, as I refer to them, companies out there, I'm more inclined for you to recommend using them for a corporation formation as opposed to a limited liability company. More often than not, if I have a client who uses those for a corporation, they're going to be in the right structure and, and their initial documents are going to be okay. They're going to have to come to us when they want to raise capital, but we're off, often not having to do any cleanup. However, what I see all the time, most of the time happen with my clients who use those services for an LLC is they just get something uh, plain and vanilla that doesn't have a lot of the provisions in there that are necessary. Certainly as those companies uh, start getting to a place where they wanna raise capital and that's often where we come in and have to fix what was been done. So if you wanna use docs in a box, I bless it for a corporation, but not for an LLC. Okay, and I know, uh, you know, I've done some of my own research and I know Michelle has as well. And there's other kinds of entities, um, you know, 
let's save that for for maybe a next discussion. Um, yeah, I'd say, say that that really some of it depends on what I'm trying to accomplish. Yeah, I would say yes. Uh, I don't think any of these necessarily apply to you at this time, and and maybe not ever. But it's good that you did your research and and you have that information with you. All right, so let's let's think about regardless of LLC or or corp corporation, right? You know that uh, Michelle and I are in this together and you know what we're trying to accomplish. Um, is there anything that I should be thinking about as, as we go forward from structuring standpoint? That's a great question, Brian. And, and I, I, I'm glad to hear Eric. you ask. Yeah, Eric, sorry. Brian's your middle name, I forgot. Um, it's a great question, Eric. And uh, what I will say is that, uh, and you may have heard this before, but a business relationship, a business partnership is like a marriage. And while most people don't uh, go into a marriage expecting divorce or put together a plan of attack in the event that there is a divorce, it's our recommendation that for a business relationship, a business marriage, that we go ahead and plan for that eventuality, even though we hope it never comes to be. I understand you and Michelle uh, have been friends for quite some time and have been working together and, and are both contributing to this idea, but it's very important that despite your handshake agreement, we document your relationship and include in, in whatever structure we go with uh, things that protect both people and protect the business so that the business can continue regardless of you know, what happens between the two of you. Uh, some of the things that we can do is attach vesting to your ownership in the business. We clearly identify uh, relation, uh, responsibilities of each partner, whether that's in the form of an employment agreement or a founder agreement. Uh, it also helps with accountability and ensuring that both parties are going in eyes wide open. We also want to have a mechanism in place to determine what happens if one partner wants to leave the business or wants to buy out the other partner. If it's only going to be two of you, we want to address some of those things early on so that when they come up, we've already dealt with that. Got it. And let me ask a question. You know, I heard you mention keeping the company's best interest in mind, you know, would you be representing the company or, or me or Michelle together? How, how does that typically work? That's another excellent question, Eric. And uh, the typical relationship is that, is that our law firm, we represent the companies as opposed to the individual, individual founders themselves. So we would represent your business and through representing your business would be able to communicate with you and Michelle, but we're not in a position to advocate for either of you. We advocate for the business itself and want to put things in place to ensure that it uh, will continue on regardless of who the owners are or the people who are running it. Got it. Great. Thank you. Okay. So um, that all makes sense. Can, can we talk about more than just, you know, Michelle and me at this point, because I know there's going to be the need for additional teammates and maybe even, you know, service providers. How do I incentivize them to come work with us? Yeah, so one thing that you're likely to run into with an early stage company without a, a great deal of capital behind you is you're going to likely have to incentivize advisors, service providers, or potentially employees with some kind of equity in your business. And as we discussed earlier with some of the differences between a corporation and an LLC, there are differences between the two. But the takeaway is, is that you need to adopt a, a legally compliant plan to issue stock or LLC interest in uh, your business to people who are providing that work for you for services. And it's important that you work with a law firm who has experience in doing that so that they can guide you in the right direction because there's a lot of landmines in issuing equity for services that you need to navigate and make sure you don't step on. Otherwise, you could blow up your whole company. Got it. That's helpful. So let's, let's get to really, you know, why I'm here, which is I need money, right? So uh, I know when I, when I looked into this, there was the, the convertible debt, the, the safe, the equity options. Can you just quickly run, run me through um, each of those? Yeah, so I think convertible debt is, is still the most common early stage financing tool when we're doing a seed financing. Uh, that's a debt instrument where you're going to take a uh, promise to repay the investor a certain amount of money with interest, or hopefully that amount of money plus interest 
converts into equity in your company, either stock if you're a corporation or membership interest if you're a limited liability company. Um, convertible debt is more investor friendly than company friendly because it is a debt instrument and they could call the note at the end of maturity and it isn't earning interest over time. Um, but fortunately, they're fa fairly straightforward to put together and investors, even uh, friends and family may have experience with them that uh, some of the other instruments they might not be as familiar with. Got it. And, and I, I know, you know, some of these should come up as, as we would start picking one, but can you just give me a quick breakdown of what these mean? Sure. So maturity date, that, that means the, the period of time uh, that, that you ha get to have the money before you have to repay it or convert it, not unlike a mortgage for a house or a car note. Discount means there's typically a discount rate somewhere in the 30 to 10% range where the person who holds this convertible note is going to pay anywhere from 30 cents or 30% or 10% less per share when uh, this convertible note converts into stock at a later equity financing. The valuation cap is also used to determine the price per share that a convertible note holder pays upon conversion into stock in a company. Got it. And, and a valuation cap isn't the valuation of my company, correct? No, it's not. Although it is um, setting a valuation of the company, it's putting a ceiling on that valuation so that if your later financing is at a, is at a financing uh, evaluation above your cap in your convertible note, then the valuation cap will apply and there will be a formula within the convertible note that will dictate what the price per share is that the note holders are going to convert into. Got it. And I've heard a ton about a safe. Tell me how that differs from a convertible note. So a safe is incredibly similar to a convertible note, but it does have a few differences that are company and founder friendly. First of all, it's not a debt instrument. You never have to repay the cash. It's just a promise to convert the amount of money that is given to you into equity at a later date based on a triggering event. Um, it's not earning interest over that period of time. There's also no maturity date, hence you don't have to pay it back. So it's, it's truly just uh, I, Investor Steven, gives you X amount of, uh, gives your company X amount of dollars. And at a later date, when you sell preferred stock in your company, Eric, I'm going to get preferred stock based on how much money I gave you. The, the uh, discount rate and valuation cap are common features in the safe as well. And that's what makes it like a convertible note. And as far as other options go, like, sorry. Which is the, is the safe or the convertible note more friendly to me as an entrepreneur? The safe is more friendly to the entrepreneurs uh, because ultimately the, the, the investors in the safe are not going to have as much money when it's time to convert as they would in a convertible note because they won't have been earning interest over the period of time. Plus, it takes pressure off of you because there's no maturity date where you have more time without a hard deadline based on your convertible note to be able to issue preferred stock at a later financing. So it gives founders more breathing room to issue safes than convertible notes. Got it, okay. And, and I think the last one that, that I should be considering is, is actually preferred stock, right? That is something you should be considering, but I, I'll, sell, I'll tell you this, Eric, right now, uh, I can't recommend that you explore preferred, selling preferred shares of preferred stock right now. Um, your company is too early stage. It's too hard to determine your value. And really, you could end up shooting yourself in the foot by giving away way too much of your company now than at a later date. It's really the benefit of the convertible note in the safe that allow you to delay the time where you're going to sell preferred stock, allow you to grow your company with the proceeds from those financings so that when you do sell your preferred stock, you're, you're getting a valuation that is more tangible and more beneficial to both the founders, the early stage investors, and the company's success overall. Great. Well, we'll, we'll exit role play mode. Amanda, I, I see you there, which tells me we're probably at Q&A time. We are, but if you want a couple minutes to wrap up before I jump into Q&A, that's fine as well. I, I think we can jump, if there's Q&A, let's, let's do that.
and knowing that that they'll get access to this, I can thumb through it at the end so that there's availability to see the rest of the slides. Okay, great. So we do have a question in the Q and A, um, and the question is: Is there a situation where a founder would uh, choose a convertible note over the safe for initial investing? I I think the answer is if your investors insist upon it. Uh, the the approach should be, you know, as we just said, safes are more founder friendly and more company friendly. However, um, you're likely in a position where you need the the capital that you're trying to raise. And if an investor says, "I'm not comfortable with a safe. I've never heard of this," uh, which you may get from somebody in the Midwest or or the East Coast, they're not going to be as familiar with safes as the investors on the West Coast. In Austin, we're seeing a lot of uh, safes and convertible notes. It's probably 50-50 with the transactions that we're doing with a slight skew towards more safes. But be uh, expect that uh, a number of investors, certainly from your friends and family circle, are gonna prefer convertible notes and, uh, and, and be prepared to adjust accordingly. Yeah, and, and let me just piggyback quickly on that is, you know, what I always like to, to say is, identify who you think your lead investor will be. Who's the person most likely to write a check? And more often than not, you're tailoring your structure, um, your entity, your vehicle for raising capital to that person. Not always, but that's a good, um, you know, sort of goalpost to be working within. So another question is, if it is typical for early startup founders to use the safe note money to partially pay for their own salaries, or is that frowned upon? I'll take this one, Stephen. Um, so I would say lawyer hat off as an investor, as a general advisor. Um, more often than not, they do not want um, that money going to exorbitant salaries. Uh, obviously, you know, roof overhead and, and food on table is important, but um, you know, as you put together the pro forma and sort of say, here's how I'm going to use the funds, which is critically important and going to be a question asked by any investor, um, leading with how you're paying yourself is not what I would recommend. Um, the right investor will recognize that they want to make sure you have security so that you can do what's necessary to get the business going and give that investor a return, but don't let it be the driver and um, you know, be mindful of what market is when it comes to what you're looking to pay yourself. Steven, Steven we can't, can't hear, you. hear you. Yeah, sorry. Reasonableness of salary is crucial in that scenario. And also expect your investors to wanna to see you have some skin in the game, whether that is with uh, actual money that you've put into the business up until the point where uh, you're trying to raise capital or they're looking for you to take some kind of um, discount as you build the business, uh, expect that as well. So, you know, like Brian said, they're, they're going to be okay with you uh, making sure you can feed yourself and have a place to live, but reasonableness is, is key. And it really also does depend on stage, right? Um, if you're a first time founder, your ability to negotiate and ask for, you know, salary is definitely different than if you're a repeat founder with successful exits. So, you know, we try not to do generalities because it really depends. So I will ask one more and then I'll let you um, kind of go through the slides that you wanted to go through. And then if we have time, I'll, um, I can ask a few more questions. Um, so this question is for early stage startups, when is the right time to establish as an entity? Sooner the better um, is yesterday. Yeah, that, that yesterday is a good one, right? It, it's the old adage: when's the best time to plant a tree? Um, you know, fifty years ago. Beyond that, it's yesterday, right? So, uh, I would say as early as possible, um, but without a doubt, uh, the minute you're starting to sign contracts of any way, shape, or form, ideally, you're going to want that to be in the name of an entity as opposed to yourself, um, you know, the minute that you're uh, using your own funds as opposed to putting them into a, you know, new bank account set up for the business, 
probably again, just making it more difficult for you to account for things going forward. So, um, you know, the sooner the better. Great. Um, and so we've got about seven minutes until three. So I yep. will let you um, go through the rest of your presentation. Great. Okay. So moving forward, um, I think where we left off was talking about, you know, uh, Stephen giving us the insight that at, at an early stage, a series seed and preferred stock may not be where you're at, but, but let's still go through this portion because it may be applicable to some of you on here who are a little bit later. Stephen, you want to jump in there? Sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, series seed preferred stock is, as we, as we talked about, Eric is something that's going to come later in, uh, later in time uh, when your company has a more tangible valuation. Um, when you do get to that place, there are some benefits. We talked about standardization with respect to corporations. This is a huge place where that exists, um, where re almost regardless of what law firm you work with or what venture capital firm you're raising money from, the uh, substance of these documents are, are pretty consistent across the board. And, um, and, and so that eliminates some of the costs, although there's a lot of negotiation that happens there as well. Um, the other benefit of a, a series seed financing or, or any preferred stock financing as opposed to a note or safe round is that you know exactly how much equity in your company you're giving away or selling, you're not giving it, selling today uh, than tomorrow. Um, that also requires negotiating evaluation, which can be a lengthy and time consuming process because VCs are gonna wanna beat you up on price and try and negotiate a bunch of protective provisions so that even if they don't have a board seat, they have their ownership structured in such a way where you have to go through them to make certain financing decisions for your company. Even though it is standard with respect to uh, documents, it can be quite a bit more expensive than a uh, safe or convertible note round. And, and as we noted, there's gonna be a lot of negotiation um, back and forth with your lead investor and then the other investors who are gonna tag along. So, you know, we've now talked about all the things that we set out to at the outset, right? Which was what type of entity, what should we be thinking about? And ultimately what vehicle do we use to raise capital? Um, and in furtherance of that, you know, the things that, that I want everybody thinking about who's looking to embark on that path is, is, you know, these practical questions that need to be answered. And the more you think about them, the more helpful it is for whatever your counsel is going to advise. And, and obviously when you go to try and do the fundraise. So, you know, how much will you need is a critical one. And, and I mentioned it before responsive to one of the Q and A's, which was, you know, you need to be thinking about, you'll hear the term, what runway you need, meaning how much are you spending every month, right? How much are you expecting to spend in a year? Um, what are you gonna need to do? Is it marketing? Is it, um, you know, code development? Is it something else? All that needs to be identified that then gives you the you know, clarity around what your capital needs are. Once you have that figured out, the other thing that will come into play, especially for probably your you know, growth stage and onward, um, regardless of whatever vehicle you use is, what do you need to be telling your investors about your business? so that they can't come back and say that you didn't disclose something and they wouldn't have invested otherwise and now you owe them the money back, right? So, you know, part of what Stephen does on a daily basis is think about securities laws and, and all that goes into that to make sure that whatever documents are being prepared to effectuate your fundraise has the necessary disclosures about legal risks, has the necessary disclosures and information that are part of all of these. And the good news is most forms um, at this point in time have a lot of what you would need to start with, which is why attorneys can, can hopefully help you get something going for less than more. But as they get tailored to your particular needs, then you know that changes. But at the end of the day, 
you know, again, disclosure is an important thing as you think about what you're telling investors about this investment they're making into you and your business. I know I made the comment when I was Eric about not wanting to um, follow corporate formalities. I don't want that to mislead anybody. As you form an entity, regardless of its kind, including an LLC, you're starting to agree to set up certain structures that not only comply with law, but also give your investors peace of mind. They wanna know that they're investing in not some fly by night um, you know, self-helped entity that you've thought about, checked a lot of the boxes we went through and have a valid and subsisting entity that will take the investment dollars, know when they're going to be distributed and how that all works. So, you know, the question has come up multiple times and we've talked about it, but the earlier, the better. Set this stuff up from day one. And there's really no, no excuse not to anymore because I think, a lot of attorneys, and I think Austin is great in this way, um, are pretty forthcoming with, with at least these checklists and information to put you, the entrepreneur, in a position to succeed. Ultimately, I wanted to just get to this slide. I know we're, we're coming up on our time. So, you know, we tried to put together some resources that we put out to people. You know, the first one you, you uh, obviously know I have a vested interest in, but here's a bunch of others. Um, you know, these are ones from reputable and, and big law firms and other accelerators and just stewards within the startup space where you can get a bunch more information, forms and otherwise, so that you can have um, what I think your goal is at the end of the day, a successfully funded startup. So with that, I think that brings us to the end. Amanda, anything further from you? Thank you so much. This was a wonderful session and I've seen a question uh, several times. Yes, we will send the recording out to our attendees. Give us about a week, um, but we will send that out um, for you to watch back and uh, get more information. And um, as always, remember that the Kelleher Center is here as a resource as well. Um, our entrepreneurs and residents and our lawyers and residents, Brian is one of them. Um, who provides some hours uh, providing general guidance, answering questions for students. Um, and you can find um, the way to make appointments to meet with entrepreneurs and residents and lawyers like Brian on our website. Uh, thank you, Brian and Stephen, and for everyone for coming. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks, all. Bye-bye.